Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. Today, we are going to talk about powerful strategies to drive revenue growth. We have some great information lined up today about AR and charge reconciliation that's going to provide you with some best practices to ensure top revenue integrity and to help you increase your revenue. My name is Caitlin Hausman, and I'm the Marketing and Communications Manager here at Ravel. I'm going to be the organizer today. Uh, joining me to present, we have Christina Harkins, a Client Performance Manager who brings to us over 10 years of experience in healthcare revenue cycle management in both acute and ambulatory settings. She's a pro when it comes to identifying revenue cycle issues and has a strange and unique obsession with denial management. So very excited to have Christina on here. This is actually the first webinar we've had Christina on. Uh, Kim White, also a client performance manager here at Ravel, will be sharing insights on the analytics your practice needs to focus on for charge reconciliation and AR. Kim also brings over 10 years of RCM experience to us and a really strong background in revenue cycle optimization and consulting. And then last but not least, we have Leslie Stewart on the line, medical coding manager at Ravel. And Leslie's gonna be discussing charge reconciliation today. She leads our team of certified professional coders at Ravel and assists with really all things medical coding, whether that's uh, providing regular training and education to our clients, performing regular chart audits, um, and then just ensuring coding compliance. All right, so moving on to some housekeeping items, just a few quick reminders I wanna mention before we get started. First, if you do have questions throughout the webinar, use the Q&A box on your screen and we'll get to as many questions as we can at the end of the webinar. Also, we are recording the webinar, so the recording and the slides will be available to you later today. And that's all I think I have. So uh, Kim, if you wanna go ahead and kick us off here, we'll get started. Whoops, let me go back here. All right, thanks, Caitlin. So I just wanna start out by talking about briefly the financial and production impact from COVID-19. Uh, we here at Ravel have seen medical practices and organizations of all sizes, from single provider groups to you know, 200 plus, impacted negatively by COVID-19. Of course, some more than others. Uh, really, a lot of that's been specialty specific and, and region specific. Um, telehealth has been a huge save within the industry, even with the brisk changes and guidelines for reimbursement. And based on some of our in-house projections, considering a 60-day shutdown, many practices, depending on productivity, will continue to see a loss until June or July before they really start to see their revenue swinging back up. And per MGMA, 97% of practices have experienced that negative financial impact, with 1% saying no and 2% that were unsure. Um, also per MGMA, on average, practices are reporting a 55% decrease in revenue and 60% reduction in patient volumes. Of course, again, all of that is really varying on provider specialty, services performed, and even the, the region, like I stated. So now more than ever, it's important to ensure that you are charging for all reimbursable services being performed, that you're doing so to the highest level in which they're being performed, as well as getting that completed in a timely manner. In addition, it's important to capture outstanding revenue for services previously performed that are reimbursable to your practice. So with those items being said, that's why with this webinar, we put together uh, from both sides, the charge reconciliation and the AR recovery, just to give you um, some real successful strategies and ideas based on our experience here at Rebel. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Leslie Stewart, who is going to start with walking through a lot of those strategies for charge reconciliation. Thanks, Kim. So uh, charge capture and charge reconciliation, that's a broad topic. And so today I kind of want to focus on some items that may trigger some questions for you uh, that will help you identify some areas of change within your practice to improve that um, revenue that we so 
um, earnestly desire to capture. Um, going along with some additional statistics from NGMA, um, it says that studies show the average cost to rework a claim is $25. They go on to say if the average cost to rework is $25 per claim and 100 claims a month require a rework, it costs an average of $2,500 a month to rework unclean claims. That's $30,000 a year, and those losses add up. To capture optimal reimbursement, you need to be proactive. You want to submit a clean claim and get paid the first time around. To do this, you need to identify your top CPT codes and denials. Determine areas where additional coding training is needed and incorporate processes that improve efficiencies and utilization. And the first step is to generate a CPT analysis report. Do you know what services you're billing? Or what, what's your specialty? What are your billable services? Are you an orthopedist? How are you billing your fracture care? Are you billing the global manipulative and non-manipulative fracture care? Or are you billing by um, itemized services, your casting and supplies? The rheumatology clinic. For the rheumatologist, infusion billing is complicated and the route of administration and time are key components. How are you billing your infusions and injections? Once we've determined the CPT codes and procedures we will, we will be billing, we want to review the local coverage determination and payer specific guidelines. What are the payable services? Medicare and our commercial payers have guidelines for each CPT code. We wanna be familiar with the frequencies. We wanna be familiar with medical necessity. And then we wanna make sure we're meeting those documentation requirements. In the case of an appeal, we wanna be able to submit that clean note with all of the documentation required to get that CPT built and paid. Another tool to improve your and reduce your coding denials is the Code Correct initiative. These uh, tools help us reduce our bundling denials and also assist with the correct modifier usage. Are we billing for services within a global period and patient comes up with a symptom that's unrelated to that primary procedure? It's a billable service. All we have to do is bill at ENM and add that 24 modifier and we get a paid service. Medical necessity. Are we still using that unspecified ICD-10 code? Have we identified a more definitive diagnosis? Are we still using that symptom code for our follow-up visits? We wanna make sure we're using that specific ICD-10 code. Are we capturing all of our ancillary services? Nurse visits 99211, that's available service. Is that patient coming in for a blood pressure check or a weight check? Is that the plan of care ordered by the physician? We can bill for that service. Is the patient coming in for a blood draw? 36415, 36416. It's a billable service if we're sending that specimen off to a lab. Are we billing for our INR testing? Are we including the urinalysis that samples that the patient is leaving early in the morning? before your clinic starts? And are we providing routine audits within our practice? Routine evaluation management and coding audits. Are you confident leveling an e and code? Are you confident your documentation supports a 99214 or 99215? Are you leaving money on the table? Are you reviewing a monthly e and bell curve report that's based on your peer specialty group? Are you coding above or below that peer group? We don't wanna leave money on the table. And this is a key for us to identify where we lack in documentation and where we wanna increase our confidence level to append or apply that higher level of e and visit. And are we thinking ahead? In October of each year, the ICD-10 codes come out. In January of each year, the new deleted and revised CPT codes come out. And are we familiar with the new changes coming up with the E&M visits for 2021? Big changes coming here. We need to be thinking ahead.
clean claim submission. We talked earlier about the cost of reworking an unclean claim. So our objection, objective should be submitting that clean claim. Are we reviewing each claim for accuracy before we submit it to the carrier? Place of service and facility. Who's treating that physician or patient and who's signing that note? Is our data service correct? Are we documenting the CPT and ICD-10 code assignments correctly? Are we appending modifiers correctly, especially for visits that um, are planned? Say we have a planned injection, but again, patient has another symptom. It's a billable service, appending 25 modifiers to your E&M. Are we documenting our procedures? Are we documenting the injectables that we're using and, and appropriately documenting the dosage and units for that medication? Denial management. Are we identifying our denial reasons? Are we creating a cath code analysis report and identifying those top 10 denials? Have we determined if it's a payer-specific denial or a coding error? Payer-specific denials can be a non-cover service or not medically indicated. Now, for me, that's a trigger. Are we using the unspecified ICD-10 codes and we're getting that non-covered denial, or are we getting that additional medical rec record request for the payers to review? If they get that document, that progress note and review, and it's noted that you've used an unspecified code, we're out of luck, we're not gonna get that service paid. So it's important to be identifying your ICD-10 usage and make sure you're using that specific ICD-10 code. Is it a coding error? Does our staff need additional training and education? Have we developed an action plan for prevention? Do our providers need additional education? Are we using our AMR to its fullest potential? Tools for charge reconciliation. I love the rural engine edit. This is a tool within ECW that can help us prevent submitting an unclean claim. It can be designed to perform edits for payers. For example, we have a payer and the primary payer requires a mental health diagnosis to be billed to their mental health payer. We can set up an edit that will alert the charge capture team to make sure the correct insurance is going out based on that diagnosis. Explosion codes. We all know that Medicare has a different administration code set for their vaccines than commercial payers. Doctors are busy. They're assigning, they're trying to take care of their patient. So they may miss or inadvertently add an incorrect CPT code for administration codes once they provide those injections. Setting up the explosion codes is gonna capture that error and automatically populate the correct code. Code correct edits, it's very important. We don't want any CPT ICD-10 mismatch. This IMO Smart Search will help you with that ICT, ICD-10 code selection. Um, clicking on the hyperlink will take you to a modifier page and it will list the CPT ICD-10 codes that uh, meet that specific diagnosis. And then we've reviewed our local coverage determinations. We know we have a CPT code and we know what ICD-10 codes meet medical necessity. We can set up mandatory diagnosis rules that eliminates that uh, non-cover service denial. And we don't want to leave uh, services and revenue opportunities that we may be able to bill for additionally. So have you explored the opportunities to build chronic care management, transitional care management? Are we using our non-physician non practitioners correctly? Are we building incident two and using uh, these mid-levels for post-op periods while the MDs focus on consults and new patients? Um, some organizations may be interested in dispensing their own DME. Are we billing appropriately for risk adjustments for that preventive care? 
advanced care planning? Are we including that, including that service during a preventive care visit? Are we offering counseling services? And are we billing for those services such as depression screening and smoking cessation? Preventive care and annual wellness exams. Patient comes in for their annual exam, but they also have a respiratory condition. We can bill separately for that. And what about telehealth? Is there a future? I believe there is. It may not pay at the non-facility rate, but I feel that the originating site guidelines are going to be changing, and I feel most carriers are going to be offering these services. So this is something you're going to want to communicate with your provider reps um, if you want to be adding this additional service. Christina? Thanks, Leslie. So today I'm going to be covering, um, discussing just a few strategies to recovering AR at all age levels. Um, four effective ways to AR include, or AR recovery, sorry, include identifying payments, denials, no responses from the payer, and patient outreach opportunities. Speaking on um, payments first, okay, in regards to payments, majority of payers now allow for EFT and ERA enrollment. So this means there's a great opportunity to expedite the way that you are receiving um, responses from insurances and the payments. Identifying the paper payments and remittances being received and enrolling those in EFT and ERAs can not only, like I said, expedite the payment, but it can also reduce the turnaround time for denials and underpayments to be received and corrected. Additionally, ERAs allow for a more efficient trending data of your payments, underpayments, and denials. Going to denials, when working insurance level claim denials, it's important to identify payer trends. So determining the root cause of the denial trend, creating and creating tangible action plans to prevent future related denials. One key part to identifying denial trends is understanding the CAS codes. So it's important to know that while the same CAS codes are used nationally, not all payers use them the same way. Because of this, it's not recommended to base your action to resolving the denials solely on the CAS code descriptions. For example, Blue Cross Blue Shield might use CAS code 197, which is authorization required, to deny a claim that's actually not being processed due to a credentialing related issue. Whereas you'll often see the smaller insurance companies using those CAS codes to the truth of the definition. So a smaller company that you um, are submitting a claim to might actually deny using that code for an actual authorization that's missing. So because of this, I don't recommend just working your denials by the definition of the CAS code, but linking your CAS codes together by your knowledge of how the payer is using them. Another effective way to identifying your denial trends is to review CAS codes by your payer group. This allows you to robustly identify payer trends and begin the process of determining the root cause of the denial. And in turn, you could appeal or correct multiple denials at one time. Going into no responses, when it comes to responses from an insurance company, no, uh, not receiving a response at all is possibly the worst response you could get, right? So oftentimes these go unnoticed or individuals tend to have the mindset of I'll allow more time. Knowing how long an insurance typically, typically takes to accept and then process a claim is key to the AR recovery. Quickly identifying claims submitted, but no acknowledgement or response by using various reporting techniques allow you to take action and resubmit without any additional aging of the claim or delay in reimbursement. It's also really important to note that the best practice recommendation is to discover why the original claim was not received or processed before submitting it again, or you could contribute to additional delays and no response again. 
Additionally, being aware of state insurance processing and prompt pay laws can help you provide leverage when communicating with an insurance group in an effort to have claims acknowledged and processed timely. Going into um, our last initiative is patient outreach. So finally, you've exhausted all of your efforts to recovering the AR. You've reached out to your insurance. You've made sure that the transmission from clearinghouse to insurance is intact, um, and you're at a loss. So reaching out to the patient is such an effective um, effort to recovering that AR. Creating a letter to the patient or any kind of outreach technique asking for assistance and letting them know of the efforts you've extended to try to have their claim paid is, like I said, just really effective. And it engages the patient in making sure that the claim is processed and that the insurance is working in their favor. I recommend, um, often recommend creating a letter to the patient whenever you receive denials or delays in payments. Denials such as coordination of benefits, demographic related information that's required or needed from the insurance, um, or like I said, even just an insurance delaying the, the claim or um, pro not processing at all. Um, I've often seen where patients are eager to help, um, especially any older um, patients that you might have. You know, some of those people really look for the their remit and their um, finalization of a claim processing to come through. So don't be afraid to reach out to your patients um, for assistance. Uh, next, Kim is going to go into some reporting and analytics to support charge reconciliation and AR recovery. All right, thanks, Christina. So the first, um, the first set of analytics that I'm going to go over um, has to do with charge reconciliation, which you guys heard a lot from Leslie today. Um, so the first item is really looking at your encounters without claims, and and that term is definitely a derivative from the eClinical Work software. But I know not everyone that is on this webinar is um, a customer of eClinical Work, so. What that really means, the encounters without claims, um, would be any of your billable visits that you do not yet have a claim for. So it's important to know what those billable encounters are that are pending charge creation. Um, the, the next thing really that ties into that as well is what is your charge lag from data service to maybe that final date of the um, progress note being locked, or whatever your, your software would, would refer to that being um, of a, a note basically being final and where we're ready to create a claim. Um, or also looking at that charge lag from the data service to when the claim was actually submitted. Um, looking at those things and knowing where you're at is really vital to keep a healthy revenue stream afloat. Um, and we do see Really, on both of those items, we we see things kind of all over the place. Um, with some practices, gen generally with a practice that you have multiple providers, not all of those providers will be uh, kind of offenders of being a little bit late. Sometimes that does happen, um, but for the most part, you'll have some providers who are more on top of that, and then some providers who are not. Um, really, our recommendation would be to have those encounters um, or those visits cleaned up and having a claim created for those within 48 hours. Um, and a lot of times the, the reason for that, that um, sometimes you'll get some, some battles from, from providers on is obviously they're extremely busy. They have a lot going on and, and oftentimes they cannot work on those notes until their you know, evening or, or personal time. So getting to a 48 hour time frame can be um, a little bit harder for some, but the, the reason why it's so important, you know, even separate from just keeping that healthy revenue stream afloat is really um, making like tying in and making sure that they remember everything that they did. Everything they did was actually documented, um, you know, with if providers are waiting a month to go in and complete their documentation. Um, of course, there's more things to that than just charge wise. You know, there could be things with that patient's medical condition 
um, that maybe they forget to put in the note. And, and that obviously is very important to make sure you have that information, but they, they could forget um, what services, you know, they actually did. Maybe they drew, drew labs, maybe they, um, you know, did a, just trying to kind of think on the spot here, a cerumen removal, um, you know, just depending on what your specialty is, um, they could forget. And so those are services that would be billable that is just, it's no longer a revenue lag issue, but it's a revenue loss issue. Um, so there's a lot of reasons of why we really recommend trying to get to, you know, 48 hours. But those two reports, um, as far as, like I said, looking at encounters without claims or the charge lag from data service to the lock date or that claim submission date is really important. Um, another thing in regards to charge reconciliation, it's not really a report. Um, but a rounding or surgical list versus the claims that you have. So it's really going to be key to ensure that you have a process in place as a checks and balances between services that are performed, especially outside of the office, uh, compared to what's being billed to eliminate missing charges. And um, that this is really, really key to make sure that all charges are being captured for what your providers are doing. Um, and there's, you know, there's a lot of ways that we see with clients of, of bringing that information back or, or having um, a checks and balances in place. Um, really a, a key recommendation that we would have um, would be to, you know, if they're on another EHR system, which a lot of times they are, if they're gonna be outside um, the practice providing services, you know, even if you have read-only access to that and you can see those patients that they end up uh, visiting that day and what was done. That way you don't have to worry about a provider having to bring back cards or even if you're using a mobile charge capture system, whether that's eClinical Mobile um, or some other system, um, again, sometimes providers can forget to enter those charges, you know, so just having that that checks and balances in place is really going to be important to ensure that you are capturing all of the charges. Um, so those are some of the key things in regards to some analytics to support charge reconciliation. Um, when we move on to AR recovery, the first thing that I'm going to start with is aging summaries in detail. So knowing what AR is outstanding um, typically looking at common aging categories, and we we usually break those down into 30-day increments, so starting from 0 to 30, and then going each 30 days until you get to 120 plus, um, and then, you know, that's kind of everything, but sometimes with those reports, especially if you're using eClinical Works, you may find that there are some that break that 30 days down past 120, um, to the point of 180. Um, but the key with that on those aging summaries in detail is really having that ability to not just break it down by the aging section that it's in or aging bucket, but to break that down by insurance group, um, by facility or facility group if you have those set up, um, breaking those down by provider, and even sometimes in the report, getting down to that CPT level, you know, or that service type. Um, those things really help for a summary overview, um, just to see where, where your AR setting. And then, of course, the detail um, is helpful if you are trying to work from those reports. Now, of course, you know, depending on whatever EHR or PM system that you're on, there's going to be a lot of different ways within that system that you can locate those claims and, and work through things. You don't necessarily have to work anymore from, you know, a report that's exported and you just pull up claims based on that report. There are some people who still find that um, to be effective for them. So by having that detail, you, you can definitely do that. Um, another thing that really ties into the aging summaries in detail is looking at your days in AR monitoring. So the average, of course, is different per specialty. Um, MGMA, you know, you're going to have some practices who may, uh, their days in AR, the average uh, for best practice may be 20 days. Some practices are 60 days, um, especially like neurosurgical practices. Um, really just it seems like the more complicated that the billing is, um, or even to be honest, the more high dollar that the billing is going to be, it typically can take a little bit longer, um, you know, to get that get that claim to a zero balance. And that's really what your days in AR is going off of. So uh, from the time that that charge gets created until that balance is zero, just looking at at an average. So that would include 
um, insurance payments, patient payments, adjustments, and, and things like that. Um, but if you see that your days in AR are really high, you know, especially if you look at MGMA numbers or, or any other um, organization, looking to see how close that you are to those peers, if you're out of range, then being able to identify what's holding up your AR. And that's where a lot of times those aging summaries can, can be helpful. You know, if, if you see, you look at days in AR overall, but then if you break that down, even by your insurance groups or facilities providers, you know, some of those things I talked about earlier, um, you can see, you know, maybe your, your days in AR looks really bad, but maybe every payer looks good except UHC. You know, maybe UHC shows that you should be getting uh, payment and claim closed within 30 days. And you're seeing, you know, for whatever reason with your practice that you're at 90 days or something. Um, now, kind of building on that a little bit, besides just seeing where it's coming from, then you're going to ask yourself, well, why is it taking so long? And sometimes there can be issues um, with, you know, with payer processing and things like that. But a lot of times it's going to tie into those denials. Um, so I know Christina talked a lot. Um, and Leslie even talked about denial management, um, but really looking at that denial trending. So like I said, it's important to know the payers, providers, facilities, or even service types that are causing that revenue, revenue lag or revenue loss. It's still going to leave you with that question of why. And that's where denial reporting is essential to ensure that you know why you're not being paid. Um, if you're having to rework claims, therefore being paid late. And I know Leslie talked a lot about even the cost that there is to rework a claim. Um, you know, sometimes you can get to a point to where a claim is being worked so many times that you're, you know, what you have in regards to system costs, labor costs, things like that, mail costs even, um, then it's all the work that you put into that is actually more money than, than what you could get back. Um, so it's important to really know what what your denials are and how how you how you can prevent those. Um, but you know, a lot of times people ask the question, "Well, how do I prevent my denials?" Well, first we have to know what they are. So typically, we'll see denials broken down um, in the following types of categories: so coding, timely filing, um, authorization and referrals, medical necessity missing information, credentialing, um, those are just a, a few. Um, there's, of course, a lot, a lot of different categories. Eligibility would be one as well. Um, so those some denials cannot be prevented. Many can be prevented before the claims are even submitted. So overall, it's so important for your, your revenue stream to make sure that claims are getting out the door quickly but you also have to ensure that besides it just being quick, that you have the quality behind it as well. Because you know you can you can submit claims all all day long, but if you're not putting the quality behind them and then getting a lot of denials, it's going to cost you more money down the road um, than just investing that time up front and and making sure those claims are clean. Um, some more analytics that I want to talk about. You know, maybe it's not something with denials. Maybe it's something um, with payment lags. So um, kind of tying that back to those aging summaries, um, if you see with certain, certain payers, providers, facilities, things like that, um, that your days in AR are really high, you look at denials, okay, we're not really having an issue there, then looking at, okay, there's, there's a payment lag issue here. So looking at reports to see the days that it's taking each payer group to reimburse you is important. Um, it really helps identify trends that could spark further discussions regarding why payers are paying later. Um, further research can be done, of course, at the provider level, service level, and, and things like that um, if, you know, if it's not denial trends. Now, one thing that we are seeing a lot um, here at Revell with our clients, um, especially like in orthopedics um, and other specialties like that who would see a lot of work comp and auto, um, although a lot of times there's kind of a, a special way to, to work those claims and make sure you're getting um, accurate reimbursement and timely reimbursement, um, we have found with a lot of the payers that when our team is following up on claims, because um, they're not getting responses, they're not, you know, if they um, look online, they're not seeing anything, if they, um, they're not getting remits, and then they call, 
and they're finding out that a lot of these work comp and auto carriers, because of course a lot of them are smaller companies, um, they're not open. Or even if you have balances that are out to attorneys, um, a lot of times those attorneys haven't been open. And then now we are seeing, of course, now that we're at the beginning of June, a lot of those places are opening back up, but they're extremely backlogged in getting claims processed. So um, I think even, you know, some of the smaller subsidiaries of Blue Cross and UHC, we've seen some of those issues with as well. But overall, those companies, of course, are, are major corporations. So they were able to, to work. And, um, you know, if their team members were not set up to work from home, they were able to quickly get those team members set up to securely work from home. Um, so claims processing could continue. Plus, there's so much of that that's electronic. Um, but, you know, that's something to think about right now as well. If, if you're looking at payment lag, see, you know, look at those insurances that you're really having those issues with. And it, it could be due to a shutdown like that. Um, the last item that I'm going to talk about in regards to uh, data to support AR recovery is going to be looking at your payments without claims or unposted payments. So to ensure you truly know what your outstanding AR is, it's important to ensure that all payments that have been received are posted and associated to those claims with balances. Um, you don't want to be a practice that, you know, let's say you have 50000 in AR and you find 25,000 of that's an unposted payments. Um, if, if you do have that type of situation, your AR is, is greatly falsified because you already actually have the revenue and should only be chasing, you know, you've got 25,000 you're chasing versus 50,000, you know, and that, that's a huge difference. And it may seem extreme, but we do find with some practices um, a very substantial amount of payments uh, without claims. So that charge has not been created, but the payments there um, or just unposted payments um, that have not been put into the system. And of course, not only does that just increase and falsify your AR on the books, but when you're trying to see, especially in times right now where the revenue is lagging so much because of productivity, then you could look out there and say, oh, I've, you know, I've got 32% of 50,000, you know, whatever your gross collection rate really is, um, looking at that and saying, okay, well, there's this much that I, I can be expecting on average to receive back whenever really you find that once you post those payments, you've got 32% on the dollar of 25,000, you know, that you could be collecting on. And, and that definitely for projections and trying to plan ahead, will make a huge difference. Um, plus, you you know, with that same example, got $25,000 in AR that team members may be trying to follow up on, which is just more money you're spending on labor um, that's really unnecessary. Um, so those are, you know, definitely with charge reconciliation and AR recovery, there's so many different reports. Um, again, whether you're using a clinical works EBO system based out of Cognos, or if you are using you know, any other PM platform or other reporting tools, um, such as Titan, um, I know that's a, a common one, or looking at a lot of reports through your clearinghouse, um, but those are some of the key ones that, that we see, and especially during this time, that we encourage you to be uh, monitoring, just to make sure that you keep that as much of an even revenue stream going as you possibly can. Great, thank you, Kim. And big thanks to Leslie and Christina as well. So glad you guys could take the time to present today and share some of your expertise. I'm sure it's been helpful to hear. And it looks like we do have some questions coming in. Uh, while everyone is typing those questions, please go ahead and submit them. We do wanna hear from you. But I also wanna take a minute to share a little bit about Ravel, or you might know us as Group One Health Source. We actually rebranded just this past December, but same company, same people, same service. If you joined today's webinar and you were kind of hoping to get some new information on how to drive revenue and improve your revenue cycle, you might be realizing that this is actually a lot of work. And obviously, as Kim pointed out, there's a lot of reports that you need to be analyzing. Uh, you might be thinking that you're not really sure if you can do this alone, or maybe you just aren't even really sure how your revenue cycle is performing and where to really start if you do need to make changes to see revenue growth. Either way, us uh, at Ravel would love to help you. I know on my screen I have this image uh, that's detailing our end-to-end -end revenue cycle service, covering really everything from eClinicalWorks training and optimization 
to medical coding review, comparative analytics, but really no matter where you're at in your journey to improve your revenue cycle, we're definitely here as a resource. We know that you're you're gonna want quick results and we're committed to helping you get them. So if you are interested in having a conversation with us to see how our teams can help, whether it be a short-term agreement or a long-term engagement for things like remote staffing, medical coding, reporting, consulting, um, an AR cleanup project, feel free to reach out to us following the webinar. We have a really great group of people here at Ravel that are committed to going above and beyond and making sure you get the results that you're looking for. So we'd love to hear from you. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and move on to questions. Um, it looks like one of the questions that came in here, Kim, will be for you. It's how do you recommend setting up charge reconciliation for outpatient services when a different EMR is used for those services? Okay, yeah, I can answer that, Caitlin. So uh, we do recommend for clients to have at minimum read-only access to the other system, uh, really to ensure that they obtain the schedule or rounding list of patients seen. Um, it's really helpful as well to be able to see the documentation to um, ensure that you can code from it versus waiting on a provider um, to bring back the charges. And it can be helpful, of course, to use systems, kind of like I talked about with the mobile charge capture. So, of course, if you're on eClinical Works, eClinical Mobile is gonna be that preferred um, charge capture module that you're using. Um, but even if you use other systems, I know PMD is a real popular one and, and really, really good. Um, but if, if providers are using that to track their patients and their charges, um, you can even have that set up to where it's sent over directly to your PM software, um, ideally, or a way for you to log in and obtain the information, um, especially if obtaining read-only access to that external EHR is an issue. Um, I know we find with some clients it's no problem, and then other clients do have a little bit of, of a challenge with that, just depending on, on the hospital system. And another one, Kim, for you would be, uh, what frequency do you suggest looking at the reports? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I'm going to say it really varies based on the type of report, um, but it is important to ensure you have access to run the data whenever needed. Um, for example, I like to see days in AR and aging summaries really on a monthly basis. However, I want to look at denial reporting um, sometimes on a weekly basis. Of course, monthly. Um, if I'm not looking at it weekly, then I would suggest um, you know by by weekly. Um, but I you know, I, I also will look at the payment lags um, bi-weekly and actually unposted payments or payments without claims. I would look at that on a daily basis. Great, thank you. Leslie, it looks like this next one um, is gonna be about telehealth for you. So for the future of telehealth, do you think the reimbursement will stay at the office e and rates with leniency in the regulations? Or are you maybe expecting things to go back to how they were before? I don't expect the payment to be as at the non-facility right now. The opportunity for these services to be uh, billed in the future, I believe there is a potential for that to happen. Now, as we know, Medicare did not recognize the audio only telephone encounter prior to this COVID-19 pandemic, but I feel with the success especially with the elderly patients able to call in and um, have their symptoms and conditions treated during this pandemic is was an eye opener for Medicare and CMS. And I feel that that's gonna be um, a benefit in the near future. Right, yeah, we'll just kind of have to wait and see how that pans out, but great insights, Leslie, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Christina, this one's kind of in regards to some of the information you covered. Where can I go to find timely filing requirements for payers? Yeah, so two of the, the go-to places and recommended places to look for those is the one, your payer portals. Um, each payer has a provider manual that really describes in detail what is required as far as submissions, data on the claim, um, and deadlines to submit not only your initial claim, but appeals, corrected claims, etc. So utilizing your payer um, provider manuals through their web portals um, is really my go-to and recommendation. 
you could have um, some more specific detail or carve out details in a contract um, that you have with a payer. These are going to be your payers such as like Blue Cross Blue Shield, Cigna, Aetna, your major commercial payers. Um, it's not common, but they might, they might be different than what is um, listed out in the portals. So looking at your contract and knowing what's included in there and then utilizing the provider manuals um, provided by each payer. Great, thank you. Uh, looks like we have just one more here. So if you have any final questions, go ahead and type those in um, and then we'll, we'll get to this one real quick. It's if I find the reasons for my common denials and then determine them preventable, how would you suggest prioritizing uh, cleaning up AR? I don't know, Kim, if you want to take that one. Yeah. So um, if you really find that you have an aged AR problem and you're also identifying how to eliminate or prevent a lot of those issues going forward, um, I usually recommend uh, kind of working it in, in two strategies that are work simultaneously. Um, so having a, a team or depending on size, you know, representative focusing on cleaning up the old AR. So what I, you know, what I would call old AR is really anything greater than 60. Um, but then having a team or again, representative um, who puts that education and changes into place, whether that is, you know, to your providers, to your staff members in the system, whatever that may be, um, that is put in place to prevent those issues for current and future AR. Um, oftentimes we find that people spend so much time focusing on the old AR, that they don't spend enough time really finding that prevention up front. Um, another common mistake that we find, or maybe not even mistake, but just not really the best strategy, is when they see they have an aged AR problem, they just put all their resources into cleaning that up. And, and I can appreciate that when they're looking at it, especially wanting to make sure that those claims um, get resolved before we hit any uh, corrected claim timely filing limits or anything like that. But the problem is, is if you put all of your focus into that area and you're not really paying attention to what's in your zero to 30 or your 31 to 60, then the next month, what was in your 31 to 60 is now your 61 to 90. So you never really get caught up working it that way. Um, plus, you don't really have that opportunity to spend a lot of the time uh, to develop those prevention plans. So really having people who focus on it from a less than 60 and a greater than 60, um, I think is really the, the best strategy to use if you find that you have um, an, an aged AR problem as well as a denial problem. All right. Thanks, Kim. Looks like that's uh, all the questions we have for today. So I wanna say thank you again to everyone for taking time out of your day to join us. Thanks again to Kim, Christina, Leslie for presenting. Super helpful content today. And uh, we'll go ahead and conclude. So we hope everyone has a great rest of their day and keep an eye out for the recording in the slides. That'll be in your inbox here shortly. Thanks.